Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for joining us today. Um, if you all were at the TA meeting last week, thank you all so much. It was really great hanging out with you all and learning from you all and hope you all got to, to meet some new folks. Um, we'll get started in a few. Also, feel free to start introducing yourselves in the chat. All right, thank you all everyone. Um, I think we can go ahead and get started. So um, thank you and welcome to everyone for joining our October 18th session of the Virtual Learning Collaborative entitled Collaborations to Support Viral Hepatitis Elimination Among Aging Populations Made Possible in Partnership with the CDC Division of Viral Hepatitis. Um, my name is Zakia Grubbs and I'm a manager on the hepatitis team and today we have with us our presenters, Shelly Ann Fluker, Associate Medical Director at the Grady Liver Clinic at Grady Memorial Hospital, Shana Jefferson Williams, Savara Hepatitis Prevention Coordinator and Epidemiologist at the Georgia Department of Public Health. And we have our moderator, Emily Cartwright with CDC Division of Viral Hepatitis. Um, also, although she can't be here today, we want to thank Leslie, Middle, Leslie Miller, Medical Director at Grady Liver Clinic at Grady Memorial Hospital for her contributions to this presentation. Um, so for the format for today's session, um, we will start with presentations from Shana and Shelly Ann, and we will be followed by a moderated discussion, which will be led by Emily. Um, so feel free to use the chat. To, to introduce yourselves and your jurisdiction, and also if you have any questions. Um, so with that, I will let Shana start with our presentations. Thank you so much. Allow me a moment to share my screen. All right, good afternoon and thank you NASAD for the invitation and allowing me the opportunity to share a little bit about the partnership between the Georgia Department of Public Health's viral hepatitis program and Grady's Liver Clinic as it relates to viral hepatitis elimination among aging populations. My name is Shana Jefferson Williams, viral hepatitis prevention coordinator with the Georgia Department of Public Health and I'm responsible for promoting and coordinating viral hepatitis prevention, testing, and linkage to care activities throughout Georgia. Some of my activities include conducting training, providing technical assistance for testing and linkage to care efforts, and collaborating with partners to integrate and increase hepatitis testing, diagnosis, and linkage to care activities. For 10 years, our program partnered with Grady's Liver Clinic on several activities that included the aging population. First, we've conducted free hepatitis C provider trainings targeting primary care and substance use treatment providers statewide. We work closely with Dr. Leslie Miller at Grady's Liver Clinic, along with other clinical partners in 2016 to conduct a five-part webinar series on best practices for hepatitis C screening, diagnosis, treatment, HIV co-infection, and the implementation of hepatitis C screening in both clinical and non-clinical settings. In 2017, we partnered again with Dr. Miller to conduct in-person hepatitis C workshops designed to educate healthcare and substance use treatment providers and other collaborative partners. Our first training took place in North Georgia in 2017 
followed by three additional workshops between 2018 and 2019. Our first training took place in Macon, Georgia in 2019, prior to the pandemic, where Dr. Miller and Dr. Fluker of Brady's Liver Clinic educated over 30 clinicians in attendance. Additionally, we had a training scheduled in 2020 that unfortunately had to be canceled due to the pandemic. During the pandemic, we had to develop a new way of reaching providers and to continue not only training, but mentorship. In collaboration with Dr. Miller and Dr. Fluker, we developed the DPH Viral Hepatitis Project ECHO, which is an acronym for Extension for Community Healthcare Outcomes. This program is a tele-mentoring model with the goal to reduce health disparities and provide best practices to care for remote communities as well as the underserved. The core of the DPH ECHO team consists of our viral hepatitis epidemiology team lead, Amy Gandhi, who is on the call, our DPH ECHO IT support, our medical experts, Dr. Miller and Dr. Fluker, and myself, the VHPC. And we have right now over 100 registered members with at least 20 attendees on each call. In each session, members of the ECHO team have the opportunity to participate in didactic presentations led by subject matter experts on topics relevant to the care and management of patients with hepatitis B and or hepatitis C infection. Our first meeting was held in April of 2021, and we've had numerous topics including treatment, cirrhosis, liver cancer, and co-infections, just to name a few. And members also have the opportunity to present cases to solicit recommendations from the viral hepatitis echo community. The target audiences for these sessions are public health professionals, primary care and specialty clinicians, nurses, pharmacists, and substance use disorder treatment providers. CE credits are currently available for participants for each session attended through the Southeast Prevention Training Center. And our echo sessions are held monthly and we are now working together to develop our ECHO curriculum for year 2024. In addition to using ECHO to reach providers statewide, we are also currently planning for two additional trainings, a virtual training and an in-person training early next year where we hope to educate more healthcare professionals, especially those in rural areas. Another activity we've partnered on is our Georgia DPH Hepatitis C Provider Toolkit, which was first developed in 2015 and later revised in 2022. And this 32-page toolkit was created for primary care providers and contains all of the resources needed to promote hepatitis C testing, including screening, recommendations, of uh, diagnosis and referrals. We also have a coding guide and educational resources for medical providers and their patients. And this toolkit can be found on our Georgia DPH viral hepatitis webpage. <laughs> Lastly, we've also collaborated in November of 2021 on our state's viral hepatitis elimination plan. Dr. Miller and Dr. Fluker were integral in developing the strategies and activities outlined in our plan and our active members of the work group, as well as the medical care and treatment subcommittee. We've worked together for over a year as members of the viral hepatitis elimination work group and met monthly to develop and establish goals and objectives for hepatitis A, B, and C. And together we've also identified target populations and developed a logic model with the goal to develop an evidence-based plan. We subsequently released our state's first viral hepatitis elimination plan in December of 2022, which can be found on our Georgia DPH viral hepatitis webpage as well. And we are currently meeting quarterly to discuss implementation of our strategies outlined in our plan. And although we do not have specific activities in our plan for aging populations, we have generalized activities used for the populations that we have identified as being priority and those born between 1945 and 1965 are identified and included in that. Thank you all so much for listening and I will now pass it over to Dr. Fluker 
of Grady Memorial Hospital to discuss more about viral hepatitis elimination among aging populations. All right. Um, I, I wanted to pause to see if there were any questions for Shana, because I think maybe we're running ahead a little bit of schedule. OK, not yet. All right. So let me go ahead and share my screen. Um, so again, I'm Dr. Shelly Ann Fluker. I am a general internist and associate medical director of the Grady Liver Clinic, which I'll be telling you about today. Um, this presentation was prepared by myself and Dr. Leslie Miller, who's a medical director of our Grady Liver Clinic, but she could not be here today. Um, so I'm going to be describing how we have been working to achieve hepatitis C elimination. Um, Shana has already highlighted a lot of the ways that we'll, we've partnered with Georgia DPH in this effort, and I will sort of go over that again. And as I go through the presentation, I'll also just be uh, specifically highlighting and calling out some things that are applicable to aging populations. Um, first, uh, these are our disclosures. Um, Dr. Miller received some grant funding from Gilead Sciences and consulting fees from AbbVie, and I received some consulting fees from Roche Pharmaceuticals. And these are my objectives. Um, this audience is very familiar with the epidemiology of hepatitis C in the United States, but I want to just touch on a few things because I think it really is important to like frame the conversation about what we're doing um, in the Grady Liver Clinic um, as we try to achieve hep C elimination. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about our Grady Liver Clinic model and then spend most of my talk time talking about um, our elimination activities and again, highlighting how this is applicable to aging populations. So first, let's start and talk just briefly about epidemiology of hepatitis C in the United States. So as you all know, um, acute cases of hepatitis C have been rising since 2014. So if you look at this data from the CDC, uh, you can see that fueled by the um, opioid epidemic, um, cases have risen year over year such that in 2021, there were just over 5,000 acute cases that were reported. Um, as you all know, um, acute cases that are reported vastly underestimates the actual number of acute infections and the CDC um, use, using their estimates um, believes that there is probably about 70,000, uh, there were probably about 70,000 acute hepatitis C infections in 2021. If you break that down by age group, um, you see that, again, in all age groups, cases of acute hepatitis C have increased uh, starting in um, 2010. And you see that young, younger adults in the age range of 20 to 39, um, followed by those 30 to 39, have the highest rates of acute infection, while those with the lowest rates are those under 20, and those 60 years or older. However, when you look at the distribution of newly reported chronic hepatitis C cases in 2021, you see this bimodal distribution that many of us are familiar with, where we have infection highest among persons 20 to 39, and those 50, 55 to 70. So I go through that because it just really highlights that when we juxtapose the fact that persons over 60 have a, are among the lowest with acute infection, but among the highest with newly reported cases of chronic hepatitis C, it just really underscores that many of our older adults still have not been screened for hepatitis C, and we're still uncovering chronic hep C among older adults who probably had it for decades. Um, this bimodal distribution of chronic infection, of course, informed the 2020 CDC guidelines that every adult shall be screened at least once for hepatitis C, that pregnant women in um, every pregnancy should be screened and that we should continue to regular screen everyone with risk factors. Unfortunately, despite these screening guidelines, um, approximately 40% of people with hepatitis, in the, hepatitis C in the US are still undiagnosed, are still unaware that they have hep C, which is one of our major barriers to hep C elimination. Uh, elimination of hepatitis C is further hindered by the fact that the majority of patients who are diagnosed are not being cured. 
despite having very effective hep C treatments, as depicted here in this graphic from the CDC, only one in three persons overall are cured. Um, and that number is even worse for those who are uninsured or young. So only a quarter of those without health insurance and a quarter of those under 40 are cured. And if you're uninsured and under 40, only one in six are cured. When the CDC looked at this HCV viral clearance by age stratified by payer group, they did see that people among uh, people who were 60 and older with Medicare or commercial insurance were the group that achieved the highest rates of viral clearance. However, that that rate was only still only 49%. So there was still more than half of this group. Um, of people over 60 with insurance who were not accessing curative HCV care. Uh, I know that you all are very well familiar with all the reasons that go into this and uh, many of the strategies that have been sort of suggested for us to tackle this. And what I'd like to do now is with that backdrop, talk about how we are trying to tackle HCV um, elimination in the Grady Liver Clinic in our health system and also, you know, partnering with others outside of our health system. So first I'll tell you about our, uh, our, our health system. Grady Liver Clinic is part of, part of the Grady Health System, which is an academic safety net hospital uh, or health system in Atlanta, Georgia. The health system includes Grady Memorial Hospital, which is the largest hospital in Georgia with 953 beds. Uh, also includes six neighborhood health centers, a center for persons living with HIV, a behavioral health center, and a behavioral health center. The majority of our patients are uninsured, as you'll see 37% are uninsured or underinsured. 22% uh, have Medicaid, 26% have Medicare, and 15% have commercial insurance. Um, the health system is very uh, busy, as demonstrated here by the number of inpatient admissions, outpatient visits, um, and emergency care that was provided in 2022. The Grady Liver Clinic itself is housed within the hospital, and we are a nationally recognized innovative model, model for hep C care that was established in 2002. We're innovative because unlike uh, traditional specialty models of HCV care, the Grady Liver Clinic is run and staffed by general internists. Um, as such, we provide critical access to care and treatment for on and underinsured patients in our health system who really otherwise wouldn't have access to care. We do have gastrointestinal subspecialists at our hospital, but as with other safety net hospitals, they're really understaffed. Um, I always talk about how they have their hands full just trying to do colonoscopy. And so we were really able to step in uh, starting in 2002 and sort of fill the gap and a need that, that was perceived to be had for care for hepatitis C in our healthcare system. Um, so as such, um, not only do we provide hepatitis C care for our health system, but we also serve as a linkage venue for screening programs outside of our healthcare system, such as our local health departments. And because we're an academic setting, we do have trainees rotating in our clinic, and that enables us to assist in training future generations of HCV providers. Our um, liver clinic utilizes a multidisciplinary team model that includes um, physicians who, again, are all general internists, um, a nurse practitioner, a clinical pharmacist, uh, a medication access coordinator, a patient navigator, and a program manager. Um, we also collaborate across our health system. Um, as you'll see soon, the majority of our patients are older adults, so they have a lot of comorbid conditions. Uh, many of them have complications from their chronic hepatitis C, and so we end up collaborating with gastroenterology, radiology, behavioral health, um, certainly with their primary care doctors, with oncology, for those who end up with liver cancer. And in addition to our collaboration across our healthcare system, we also collaborate um, outside our health system with the Department of Public Health, as well as with community organizations. 
So having told you a little bit about the structure of our liver clinic, I now want to turn to describing the four ways in which we're approaching hep C elimination. Uh, the first two are within our health system, and that's with screening and linkage to care programs and our treatment program. And the second two are outside of our healthcare system through building community treatment capacity and policy action. So first let's talk about screening. Um, as I mentioned, the liver clinic was established in 2002, and this was due in large part to a perception that we had a very high burden of HCV among our patient population. However, we didn't actually know what our actual prevalence of HCV was. Um, in 2012, however, when the, when the HCV screening guidelines were had their first update, where they were updated to screen all persons born between 1945 and 1965, we were um, awarded a CDC demonstration grant, uh, which allowed us to launch our first screening program, which we call TILT-C. We started um, this program with our faculty and trainees in the primary care center that's housed in the hospital at Grady Memorial Hospital. And we basically went around and educated every provider, um, quite, a, quite a few providers, about how to screen, oh, about the new guidelines, the rationale for the new guidelines, how to screen patients, how to interpret the results. And then we told everybody that they could link everybody who screened positive to care in our Grady Liver Clinic, which at that point had already been in existence for 10 years. As you can see here, over the, third, over the 30 months that we conducted that first screening program, we tested over 5,000 people and we um, uncovered what we had always suspected, which is that we had a very high rate of hepatitis C and our rate of Hep C exposure, Hep C antibody positive was 8%. We then went on to um, do a screen, a focus screening program, um, which has been ongoing since 2015 through now. Um, and through that program, we have tested over 95,000 persons. Um, and we have, on, with that, um, still have a very high prevalence rate of 7% 7, 7, 7 um, of, of hepatitis C exposure. Um, we accomplished the implementation of our health system wide screening program by expanding it over time. So as I mentioned, we started with our faculty and trainees in the primary care center at the hospital, and this was followed by the neighborhood health centers, um, then the ambulatory specialty clinics, inpatient settings, so hospitalized patients, um, the emergency room, our walk-in clinic, and then in 2020, with the updated screening guidelines that recommended screening um, every pregnant woman during every pregnancy, we expanded it to the OB clinics. The tools that we've used to support the screening has evolved over time. Initially, when we first started in 2012, we basically created a dot phrase that we encourage providers to place into their um, clinic notes. Um, that would basically remind them to screen persons born between 1945 and 1965. We then worked with our electronic health record, which is EPIC, to create a best practice advisory that would appear for anybody um, who qualified for hep C screening. And again, initially, this was just persons born between 1945 and 1965. We then continue to leverage our EHR for our screening protocols. And this slide shows an example of how our EHR logic worked when we sort of rolled out into the emergency department. At this point, we were right around the time that um, screening for all adults was rolling out as a recommendation. And so we um, set up sort of the EHR logic to um, trigger that somebody needed screening if they were age 18 to 79, they didn't have any prior hep C diagnosis, and they had no prior HCV test. If that was the case, then an HCV screening tab would appear, and we used an opt-out approach such that the nurse would place an order for the hep C antibody tests, um, and then the doctor would basically verify with the patient that they would agree to screening before signing the order. The final iteration um, in working with our EHR to, to sort of um, streamline and make our hepatitis screen easier was adding 
um, hepatitis C screening to our health maintenance care gaps. Um, so along the along with, you know, it's time for your flu shot, it's time for your mammogram, it's time for your pap smear, hepatitis C screening will also appear if somebody who um, is 18 to above 18 has not been previously screened. So this slide shows kind of the outcome of that whole screening um, program, along with the rest of our care cascade for persons who were screened from 2015 to 2022. As you can see, at each level of the care cascade, we do lose some patients, which all of you know is, um, is something that happens with hepatitis C and several other chronic disease cascades. Um, you, I'll highlight a couple of these. Um, one is you'll see that um, only 89% of our patients who screen positive for hep C antibody were RNA tested. This reflects the fact that um, early on in our screening initiative, we didn't have any kind of reflex testing. So ba basically patients were screened for hepatitis C with an antibody test. If they screen positive, we had to call them back to come in and do a separate um, hepatitis C RNA for confirmatory testing. Uh, we do have reflex testing now. Um, and now that's a very uncommon occurrence, but when we sort of put that data together from those two time periods, before and after we had reflex testing, that led to this 89% um, RNA tested. Um, of those, we have 51% uh, um, who are viremic, which represents 3% of the total number of people we tested. And of those, 59% um, are linked to care, leaving still 41% of patients who do not access hep C treatment. So the way I, det I, I interpret this data is that it depends on if I'm feeling half glass full or half glass empty. And on my half glass full days, I'm like, this is awesome. The majority of our patients are getting linked to care. But on my half, half glass empty days, I really uh, want to figure out how we can get that other 41% of patients linked to care. Um, the second part of, we are, of how we are approaching elimination in our health system is, of course, through treatment. And in addition to offering treatment for hepatitis C, we do offer wraparound services, including education about hepatitis C, so how you, how you get it, how it's transmitted. Uh, we talk about liver health and we counsel patients about liver health. Uh, we offer appropriate vaccinations, in particular hepatitis A and hepatitis B, but any appropriate vaccination we offer to our patients. We do do fibrosis staging aimed at determining who has cirrhosis. And this is particularly important among older adults as the risk of cirrhosis goes um, increases the longer you have hepatitis C. Many of our older adults have had hepatitis C for decades prior to their diagnosis. And it's really common for us to be the first person to basically this, determine that somebody has cirrhosis. Um, and so this is a really critical part of taking care of older adults. Uh, for those who do have cirrhosis, we do manage their cirrhosis, um, making sure they have the proper screening, uh, making sure they have the proper counseling and other things that are needed. We partner again with other specialists in our health system if needed. And we continue to manage our patients who have cirrhosis for their cirrhosis monitoring, even after we have cured them of their hepatitis C. In terms of our treatment process, this is overseen by our clinical pharmacists, um, and they ensure that patients' treatment completion and cure is maximized. Um, they check in with patients every four weeks, utilizing in-person and telehealth visits through the duration of their treatment. Um, and then we provide them their hepatitis C medication in at their office visits, we hand it to them, or if it's a telehealth visit, we courier to courier to it to them. Um, 12 weeks after treatment is completed, patients are reminded to come to the lab for their test of cure, and then their results are provided to them by telephone. Before I show you our treatment results, I just want to give you a sense of who we are serving in the Grady Liver Clinic. Uh, this is a table from a paper we published earlier this year in Public Health Reports about our experience in our clinic from 2015 to 2019. And as you can see, most of our patients are older. Our mean age is about 64. 64% um, of our patients are, ma uh, are male, 84% are African-American, 
and a quarter of our patients have cirrhosis. As I've already described, this patient population is also medically underserved and are disproportionately impacted by social determinants of health. Uh, in addition, I wanna give you um, a sense of their comorbid conditions. And as you would expect in an older, medically underserved patient populations, there are numerous comorbid com conditions. So hypertension is the most common medical condition among our patients with 50%. About 20% of them have diabetes. 17% uh, have chronic pain, 12% have lung disease, 10% have heart disease. And then when you think about more um, psychiatric and behavioral health conditions, 28% have depression, 72% have current or former alcohol use. The majority of that is former alcohol use, only about 20% have current alcohol use, and then 64% have former drug use. Um, again, um, not, not a huge proportion with active drug use in our, in our particular patient population. So giving that in that context um, of the patients that we're serving, we are really proud that using these highly effective direct anti antivirals that we have, we achieve really high cure rates of, uh, in our clinic. So this, for those people who make it through, all the way through the cascade to the point where we offer them treatment, you can see year over year as our antiviral therapy improved, our cure rates improved. And starting since 2016, we've been achieving cure rates of over 95% uh, in this medically underserved uh, patient population. So our goal is really to continue to strive to achieve microelimination of our help, hep C of hep C in our health system by really focusing on our screening, linkage to care, and then trying to get people through treatment. Okay, I will finish up by describing our efforts to um, go beyond our health system, um, again, with an eye towards hep C elimination. And as I mentioned, we've done this in two ways, by building treatment capacity for hepatitis C and through policy action. These are the four ways that we're working to build treatment um, HCV capacity. Um, Shana has gone over how we've worked with Georgia DPH to do provider trainings, as well as our Georgia DPH ECHO program. So I will just briefly describe the other ways that we um, have been working on building treatment capacity. Uh, one is with on-site community partner trainings, and these have been done um, by Dr. Miller. Um, and just so you could know who she is, she's the person in the middle uh, on this picture. And she has done trainings in substance use programs, um, such as St. Jude's Recovery Center and Alliance Recovery Center, both in Metro Atlanta. She's gone to community clinics um, in Savannah, St. Mary's, Georgia, Statesboro, Georgia, and done trainings there. And she's even um, done a training for our health system, the St. Joseph's Candler Health System in Savannah, Georgia. And so when she's gone to these different sites, she's talked to them about screening and linkage to care and treatment models based on our experience in the Great Liver Clinic, which has been really well received and has been um, the, the impetus that has allowed many of these places to establish their own similar type of screening linkage to care and treatment programs. The other thing that we've done is continuing medical education training for um, physicians, pharmacists, uh, physician assistants, nurse practitioners, um, and public health um, providers. So we have, um, this is a picture of um, a symposium that we held in uh, 2019 and in 2020, or maybe it was 2020 and 2021. One was in person, one was virtual. Um, and that was held at Emory um, and drew a regional audience. We've also participated in other, other CME trainings, including Block HCV, Bridge HCV, the AMA telemonitoring CDC funding uh, training, as well as the um, um, American Academy of Family Physicians regional meetings. Um, and uh, you'll meet Dr. Cartwright soon, but Dr. Cartwright has partnered with us and you can see that she's was one of our faculty in our hands-on hep C training in this picture. All right, and so as I finish up, I just wanna mention that we've also been actively engaged with elimination work in the state of Georgia and nationwide. Again, as Shana described, we have been really honored to work with the Georgia DPH in their viral hepatitis C elimination work group, um, and as well as in their medical treatment subgroup. In addition to that, um, we have participated in the HEPVU and NASDAQ viral hepatitis 
Surveillance Steering Committee and the NVHR Hepatitis C State of Medicaid Access Steering Committee. So in conclusion, the Grady Liver Clinic, I hope I've convinced you, plays an important role in HCV elimination efforts in Atlanta and beyond through its HCV screening, linkage to care, treatment and education programs. The Grady Liver Clinic has had a long and fruitful partnership with both the CDC and DPH working collaboratively on HCV elimination efforts. Our future goals include expanding the HCV treatment workforce by continuing to provide trainings, um, as well as working with our telementoring via Project ECTO, and we will continue to work on state and nationwide elimination efforts. Okay, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Fluker and Shana for those excellent presentations. Um, I'll open it up now to any questions. Um, I guess I'll take the moderator's um, prerogative here and ask the first question, if that's okay. And I should um, fully disclose that I was one of the trainees in the Grady Liver Clinic and um, inspired to treat people with um, viral hepatitis uh, after working with Dr. Fluker. And I see patients at the Atlanta VA and um, really have just been a large admirer of all the work that goes on in the Grady Liver Clinic. So it's really exciting to hear about the partnership with the Georgia Department of Public Health and to think about ways um, that we can partner to eliminate hepatitis C in the state of Georgia and in the U.S. And so I was really interested in the presentation when you showed the changes from screening um, where initially you were having to call patients back when their antibody was positive to have the RNA testing done and then how you switched over to reflex testing. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how that came to be. Yeah, I think that's a great question because that's really an important part, I think, of any of improving our screening initiatives. And I wish Dr. Miller was here because that was her baby. And I so I want to acknowledge that she like fought the hard fight for that. <laughs> and it wasn't in, indeed a hard fight. You know what I mean? There was a lot of um, discussions and meetings that had to be had with health system leaders, with the lab to really like make the case that this was an important thing in order to um, actually capture um, the scope to, to be able to, to diagnose more patients and really treat and manage them. So there was a lot of um, um, sort of financial, you know, what's the financial case here for this as well as what's the patient care case. I do think that it, um, part of what helped us sort of champion that was because we had a treatment program. And so we said, you know, once we diagnose these people, we can actually treat them. Um, and that has benefits all around, right? It has benefits for the patients. It has benefits for the health system. Uh, so that was part of what made the case. But I do think like even with it, without having a, a sort of designated site where you can treat those patients, um, it's it's a it's a battle that's worth fighting, um, and it will involve sort of I think engaging all levels of healthcare leadership, um, and sort of making the financial case as well as the patient care case for why it's important. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, we um, had a similar situation in the VA as well, and we found um, in a national study that VA facilities that did reflex testing were much more likely to have complete testing, mm -hmm. and if they required a subsequent visit for the blood draw, that only about 64% of the time did they have complete testing done. So I think, you know, from a patient standpoint, not knowing you know, you showed that only 50% of them ended up being biremic approximately. So, you know, not having that complete testing, not knowing if you need treatment, um, having to come back and go back and have more blood drawn can be a real barrier. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. In terms of treating older adults, have you found that there's any 
um, specific barriers or challenges that are different in an older population compared with younger patients with hep C? Yeah, yeah, no, I think that's a great question. Um, and I think there are. Um, interestingly, for a long time, you know, most of our patients, like I said, were, you know, over 65 or or in that old age range. And so that was all I did. That's all I knew, right? Um, and as the as we've seen an increasing number of cases among younger people um, fueled by the opioid epidemic, now we start to see a little bit more of younger patients. Like I, it used to be zero younger patients and now I see some in my clinic. And I'm like, oh my gosh, these patients are so easy. Like <laughs> when a 30 year old comes in, I'm like, I don't know what to do with myself. You're so easy. And so that's really highlighted for me, the differences between taking care of younger patients and older patients. Um, I think, you know, one plus is that you know, older patients will often have insurance, but they also have a lot more comorbid conditions. They're way more likely to have cirrhosis and that brings a whole nother um, set of problems. Um, I also think there's um, issues just backing up a bit, like screening older adults. Like I think not, they're not necessarily as accepting of it. I still, I am pretty sure my in-laws still have not been screened because they don't, they're like, I don't have that C, you know what I mean? <laughs> so I think there's also that issue. I think they're not as accepting, but but for me, once they get to us, I think it's the all the comorbid conditions, the higher likelihood of having cirrhosis. Um, you know, when I have a young person who comes into clinic, I'm ready to give them their hep C medicine that day, right? But that is not often the case with my older adults. Like I have to figure out their fibrosis staging and then they have cirrhosis and I got to screen them for for liver cancer, or they're on, um, I know we talked a little bit uh, before this started, Emily, about medications. They're on medications that interact with the hep C medicine. So I got to work with their cardiologist or their neurologist or other people to, um, to, um, to, to sort of ensure that we can safely treat them. We also will even treat patients who have cognitive impairment, um, and that, that's not uncommon in our clinic. And so when they have cognitive impairment, dementia or whatever it might be, we're like having to engage with their caregivers and sort of get them sort of engaged in, in helping care for the patient. So um, it's what I'm used to. But yeah, when I have a young person, I'm like, oh, there's nothing to do except give you your health C medicine. <laughs> yeah. Are there any specific tools that you recommend people use in terms of screening for fibrosis um, or screening for liver cancer that you found to be helpful? Yeah, I mean, there are several ways to um, screen for fibrosis. Um, the, the easiest way is just with blood tests. And so you can use the usual blood tests that you um, would utilize when you're seeing somebody with hepatitis C, which would include your liver enzymes. Um, your blood count. And with that, I know you know this, Emily, <laughs> with that, you can calculate scores that are called APRI and FIB4. And basically those can be used to um, estimate or, or guesstimate if somebody has cirrhosis. Um, this is probably more detail than this audience needs, but there are simplified treatment guidelines that we utilize in some settings. And that can be utilized in a lot of settings where using that that number called a fib4 is all that's needed to help in um utilize in help in um, deciding fibrosis staging so that's the most straightforward simplest way there are other ways that we do in our clinic because we have a lot of other tools but that's sort of the the quickest easiest way i do see some questions popping up in the chat so yeah <laughs> um so it looks like one of the um questions was in patients either younger or older who are actively using substances, um, do you still offer treatment in that setting? Yeah, absolutely. And I think like this is something that um, changed for me over time because, you know, when I first started taking care of patients with hepatitis C, we were treating with pegylated interferon and ribavirin. Maybe everybody on here is too young to even know what that is, but <laughs> um, but they weren't very good treatments. <laughs> okay, some people know. <laughs> um, and part of the guidelines was people had to be abstinent, you know, from alcohol or drug use for six months before you could treat them. Um, but you know, with the um, with having now very highly effective direct acting antivirals, there's just no reason for that. 
And in fact, if we are not treating people who are actively using substances, then we're not ever gonna get this epidemic under control and eliminated. We have to treat those people. And really what sort of what my sort of tipping point is, do I think this person is gonna take the medication every day, right? There might be people whose substance use behavior may just prevent them from being able to take a pill every day, right? But if I think that this person can take a pill every day, I'm going to give it to them. Uh, and most likely they're going to be cured. And there's a lot of data that supports that if you, because that's now you have an opportunity to engage them in care, right? Now you have the opportunity to be like, let me give you, you know, treatment for your substance use disorder, whatever it is. Let me get you into behavioral health therapy. Let me get you into a group. So you actually use that as an opportunity to try to help them with their substance use disorder. And there's a lot of data that supports with especially when you do that, rates of reinfection are very low because that's always a concern, right? You're going to treat them and they're going to be reinfected, but there's like plenty of data supporting that rates of reinfection are low, especially if you can sort of help use that as an opportunity to engage in um, substance use disorders. Um, I also saw a question, Emily, I don't know if you saw it. Somebody was asking about the prevalence of hepatitis C in our, in our, our, our group, our patient population. And you're absolutely right. Like we're we're much higher than prevalence rates than sort of the general population. Um, among baby boomers, it's like three and a half percent, and our baby boomers was like twice that. Um, and then depending on what your your prevalence is, really going to vary um, depending on where you are. But in some places, you have prevalence rates as high as three three and a half percent. Um, basically equivalent to what it is among baby boomers, um, among young adults. And that was part of like what prompted the recommendation to start doing universal screening because we were already screening baby boomers because of this 3.5% prevalence. And then we saw that there were places where young adults had the same prevalence rate. So we, yes, yes to whoever asked that question, our prevalence rate is high. What's your prevalence rate, Emily, in, at the VA? Do you, do you know off the top of your head? Yeah, it's high. It's about 10%. Yeah, that's what I thought. I was going to say it's probably even higher at the VA. Yeah. Yeah. And um, that's, we've been screening actually Vietnam era veterans for a long time, which overlaps a lot with the baby boomer cohort, those mm -hmm. born 1945 to 1965. And there is a high prevalence in um, veterans and then also in younger veterans also we're seeing that as well. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that there's another question as well about um, treatment in patients with cognitive impairment. And uh, you sort of mentioned that that's one of the challenges we see when treating older adults. And do patients still accept treatment? And are there still benefits um, of treatment in that population? Yeah, you know, it's a tough question, right? Um... The recommendations are basically like treat everybody with hep C, right? Unless for some reason um, they have like re a really short life expectancy that can't be turned around by treating their hep C. <laughs> so, so the recommendations would support screening people even with cognitive impairment. Um, you know, everybody's an individual, right? So I think you always have to make a decision that... Um, is in the best interest of that person. Um, if this is somebody who um, has good family support um, and it won't be hard for them to take the medication, the family can ensure that they do so, there's probably not a really a lot of downside. You know, the medications are safe. They don't have a lot of side effects. Really, you just need somebody to take it every day for the eight to 12 week, which is a typical course, and they're going to be cured, right? Um, and so there's not a lot of downside of that, and there's probably more upside. Um, that being said, you know, I think, again, you have to individualize it to the person and their family and their situation, and you got to think about, like, where, and, th and this is where fibrosis staging is really important, right? Because if you do fibrosis staging and you determine that they have very low stage fibrosis, and the family's like, it's going to be so hard to get them to take this medication every day. You know what I mean? That's probably somebody I'd say, you know what? And, and they're 80 years old. I'd probably say, well, you know what? It's not a big deal. The likelihood they're, they're going to progress to a, a stage of cirrhosis in their lifetime is low. 
let's not add this burden to this particular person. So I think you do have to individualize it, but we have certainly tr treated patients with cognitive impairment after kind of having that type of, yes, and shared decision-making <laughs> uh, with, with them and their family. Um, there's a question about stigma um, that a lot of health departments are um, struggling to address stigma by providers. And is that something that's covered in training when you meet with providers and provide education? I, I'm, I'm not sure I understand the question, like stigma of that providers have, like, like, yeah, I think maybe stigma regarding um, who to treat and, and maybe um, discrimination considering providers that hesitate people that use so maybe in substance use um, specifically yeah. context you know, I don't know that we have like specifically called it out as stigma and maybe we should um, but we certainly make the case that everybody should be treated and that there are very few people who should not be treated and if there are reasons why they should not be treated like active substance use that should be something that we should be addressing and so we really try to make the case that this is a curable condition. This is a condition we can actually eliminate. Like we have all the tools to do it um, and we should utilize that. You know what I mean? And we can really prevent, you know, serious comorbid complications and debility and illness and all the things that come if people develop cirrhosis. Um, and so I'll take that into consideration. We might need to call out the stigma specifically, but we really do make the case that everybody is a candidate for treatment, including people who have historically been uh, marginalized and not given treatment for hep C. Yeah, one of the things we found um, sometimes is like old habits die hard. And I think that that restriction but from the interferon days to not um, treat people who are actively using substances and not drinking alcohol um, was hard to sort of get people to move away from in this current era. And there's really no data to support those restrictions. And so I think that there's been this transition, but some payers still require abstinence mm -hmm. and um, and sometimes even providers are reluctant to refer for treatment because they think that those restrictions might still be in place. And what we found um, in our population is regardless of the alcohol use prior to treatment, that people are cured at very high rates and the drugs are highly effective. Um, there's a question about how much of the medicine you have to take and is perfect adherence required to be cured? Um, what are your thoughts on that, Dr. Fluker? Perfect adherence is not required to be cured. <laughs> and that's a good segue to that, right? Because that's one of the concerns that people have with people who are drinking or using drugs, that they're not going to take the medicine. And even though I said, like, I need to be fairly convinced that they're going to take the medicine, just normal everyday people don't take all their medicines, right? Like, I think if I asked him here, who took their entire antibiotic course for X infection, nobody's gonna put up their hand. So they're just, just like people who are living their normal lives, nobody is, you know, 100% in here adherent. So I, I, when I said that, I really meant that, like, you know, I, I think I have a good faith that this person is gonna do their, you know, you know, your spidey said, says, I think this person is gonna take their medicine, right? Um, as best as they can. But yeah, we've had plenty of cases where we knew for a fact, <laughs> like patients told us, they brought in their pill bottles and showed us that um, they didn't take all their medication and they were still cured, you know? Um, that being said, when patients are not cured, that is the primary reason in our experience is incomplete adherence. But yes, there are plenty of people who take, who don't, I, we've even had patients, you probably had this happen, Emily, who took four weeks of treatment and were cured. That's not the norm, but we've definitely had cases of people who only took four of a 12 week course or four of an eight week course and was cured. Now I don't tell anybody that. <laughs> I really emphasize you need to take this medicine every day. You need to take this medicine every day because I want them striving for perfection. And if they miss one or two pills, it's not a big deal. Um, but to answer the question, honestly, um, yes, you can be cured even with incomplete adherence. Yeah, that's been our experience as well. One of the things that we found has been really helpful is having patients in a little bit more supportive setting. So we um, partnered with our residential treatment program. So when people were being treated for substance use disorder, 
It's actually a 90 day program. And so their housing is stable. And I think that's really like an ideal time to treat someone. And maybe they're not perfect with it every day, but they have a lot less chaos going on. And I think that they can take the medication during that time. Um, yeah. And I think that's challenges we have is sometimes people it's so easy to take that they forget that they've taken it <laughs> and so to remind them yes you've already been treated <laughs> yeah and I think that's why that's a big part of why we have kept as a part of our model having our pharmacists um, check in with patients in person or by telehealth every four weeks again referring to those simplified treatment guidelines that I mentioned as you know Emily they basically said you can just give people, patients the pills and let them go, right? Like you don't have to do any sort of on-treatment monitoring, but we have held on to it because in thinking about our patient population who are complex, medically underserved, have social determinants of health, we think it's important that they have somebody sort of being their accountability partner in a way um, and, and helping troubleshoot pop, um, issues that arise. Like if people um, miss a few days of treatment, it doesn't necessarily mean that we have to throw in the towel and not treat them. Depending on how many days they missed, we can like get back on treatment or we can sort of test to see where they are. And so having that for every four week check in, not as good as a residential program, but we feel like it's important, at least in our patient population, to really get people across the finish line. Yeah, we found the same too. I think meeting people kind of where they're at and in a setting that works for them. Um, sometimes people come back in person for a week four visit and we'll give them maybe the second vaccine if they're in the middle of a vaccine series. If it's very hard for them to travel, we'll mail the entire course up front and check in by phone. And so I think that, um, you know, you do have to individualize treatment and find ways to, to help people be successful. Um, we have a question about viral load. And does it impact the amount of medication needed to be cured? Are you changing your treatment regimens based on the viral load? And um, if someone was cured in just four weeks, was it because they had a small viral load to start with? Yeah, so quick answer to the question is no. It doesn't matter what your viral load is in terms of how we treat you. It's the same treatment course for everybody. And I, and I don't know the answer to the question about why people are cured in four, in four weeks. I don't necessarily think it has to do with their viral load. That we, we know that patients' viral loads actually go up and down. So if you're checking people over time, you'll see their viral loads going up and down. So I, I don't know. I don't know why people get cured with four weeks of therapy. They just, they're just lucky. Maybe their immune system just really revs up. <laughs> I also saw a question about something about insurance. Um, let's see. Yeah, with Medicare Part D plans, do you find that it's usually easy or difficult to get um, Medicare Part D to approve the DAA? Yeah, treatment? so so as I mentioned, we are really lucky to have a dedicated staff member, a medication access coordinator who does, you do need to do prior authorization for patients with insurance. And we're really lucky to have a staff member who does the prior authorization. Before she came on board, like we did it as providers and I hated it. It was like, <laughs> I love I loved taking care of patients with hep C, but I hated that. But that's her whole job. That's her whole thing. She knows how to get it done. Uh, so we don't have a lot of trouble. Um, we actually have most of our problems with um, some of the health exchange plans. Uh, they tend to be like a little stricter and have like, silly guidelines, like you have to be a hepatitis C specialist. So then we say, yes, we're hepatitis C specialists. <laughs> um, but we have just been lucky with having um, a staff member who just has figured it out and she knows what to do, what we need to do to ensure our patients um, get approved um, through their insurance. All right, it seems like we might be out of time. Yeah, we are wrapping up. Um... I want to just take this time to thank again our presenters. I think this was really an excellent um, overview of some excellent work that's being done. And um, I'll turn it over to Zakia. 
Yeah, I, I agree. It's really a really great presentation. Um, it's definitely a great um, continuation of some of the conversations we've been having about this year's Chairs Challenge, focusing on people aging with hepatitis and it's just HIV. Um, and I don't know, it's just a lot of interesting things for me to learn, especially from the clinical perspective. What are some things to consider when we're working with older populations? Um, so I just want to say thank you all so much for our presenters and our moderators um, for today's session. And y'all have a good afternoon. And thank you. Yeah, let us know if y'all have any questions or anything to follow up. But thank you so much. Thank you.